Amen. Well, I want to uh, speak on a subject today that I haven't really spoken on a lot. And I, I probably speak on it more than other people speak on it, which is kind of a shame because it's an important subject. And that is on God's judgment. God's judgment. Now, this isn't necessarily a jump up and run around the building kind of sermon. But I believe that in the church of God, that is in the universal church, I believe we're a little bit lopsided when it comes to talking about God. Right? We often talk about how good God is, and God is good, right? Amen. We can say that for sure. But sometimes we, we overload on one aspect of God, and we don't cover the full spectrum on who God is. When Nehemiah was praying, he said, he prayed and he said, our great and terrible God. Now, the way Nehemiah and the Bible use the word terrible is different from the way we use terrible. The word terrible in those days meant invoking terror, okay? Like Ivan the Terrible, some Russian dictator or something like that, right? So to be terrible means you invoke terror. And the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. Our, our, our God is great. Our God is terrible. He invokes terror. He is, a, he is a God who is great and is to be feared. And often we don't hear people talk about the fear of the Lord because it's not very, a very popular subject to talk about. But the Bible says, fear the Lord, all you his saints. Amen? That's what the Bible says. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, you can turn there. I'm sorry I don't have any uh, scriptures on the board today, but you just have to turn in your Bible with me or just listen. Paul is talking about the time that's going to come that he's going to depart from the earth and you know he's going to put off his earthly house as he puts it or his earthly tent as he puts it in verse 1. And as the Bible continually talks about there's coming a day where God will judge the world. And he begins to talk about that in, uh, later on in this chapter. And he says this in verse 9. So let's uh, read 2 Corinthians verse 9. And if you can get those on, oh, you can. Okay, I'm in the New King James. If I don't know what you got back there. So we're going to start at verse 9, and we're going to read through verse 11. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, this is one of the core doctrines of the church. It's something that we need to remind ourselves of continually, that one day every single one of us, whether good or bad, will stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of our life. All right? Now, that's something we ought to meditate on and think about very carefully, that everything you do, everything you say, is recorded in the books, and one day those books will be open, and Jesus Christ will look you in the eyeball and he'll open the books and, say, and your life will be laid out before Jesus Christ. That's a little scary. It's a little scary, depending on where you are with God, right? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I, I'd, I'd say it's, it's, def, it's scary for saints, but it's especially scary for those who are rebellious against God, who haven't made their life right with God. And this is what Paul talks about, because I believe, you know, some people have some different uh, ideas about this, but I believe the judgment seat of Christ is, is the place where everyone will appear before. Jesus said, all judgment has been committed to the Son. Now, some people think there's a separate judgment for the saints, and there's a separate judgment for the wicked. I don't believe that's true. That's something you can look into yourself. I think every single person is going to stand before Jesus Christ. He's the one that sits on the great white throne. All judgment has been committed to Son, and every single person that's ever lived will stand before Jesus and give an account for their life. And so Paul apparently had a good understanding of this, a good revelation of this, because this was Paul's motivation when he went out to preach the gospel. And in verse 11, he says this, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the terror of the Lord. So Paul, as he goes about and as he's talking to people, as he's preaching the gospel, he's thinking, here is a person, here is a man, here is a woman that is going to stand before God one day. And it's either going to go pretty good for them 
or it's going to go really, really bad for them. And I know that, and I understand that, and I have a revelation of that. Paul had a revelation of that from the Scriptures, from reading the Bible. He had a revelation, he had a a supernatural revelation because he met Jesus Christ on the road. And I bet when he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, it scared the blank out of him. Because he wasn't walking with God the way he should have. And I'll tell you what, every one of us is going to have an experience like that, where the light shines and all of a sudden we see Jesus Christ and we're face to face with him. And it can either be a good experience now or it can be a bad experience later. Wouldn't you rather be a good experience now rather than a bad experience later? It's always better, young people. This is just a, 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 a temporal example. It's always better just to fess up to what you've done to your parents and get it, get it out of the way now. Hello, Any young folks? You've done something you shouldn't have done? You better talk to your mom and dad and get it right. It's better because it would be bad if you let it linger. And the same is true with the Lord. Knowing the terror, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And if you go down a little bit, so Paul is talking about his motivation to preach the gospel. If you go down a little bit, the Bible says the love of Christ compels us. All right? So he's continuing to talk about his motivation to preach the gospel. What what does he mean the love of God compels us? He means I don't want anybody to suffer the terrible fate that the wicked are going to suffer before God. All right? And when I say wicked, you know who I mean? Everybody. Besides those whose sins are forgiven. So if you're in this place and you say, oh, I'm not such a bad person. Well, Jesus said you are. Isn't this an encouraging message this morning? <laughs> you know, when, I, when I'm out on the street, sometimes I pass out tracks. And... uh when I'm passing out the tracks, a lot of people, you know, depending on where you are, a lot of people take them. Some places, barely anybody takes them. But one of the, the common things that people say when, they, when, they, when they, they refuse the track, they said, no, I'm good. So if I'm quick enough, I said, you know, Jesus said no one's good except one. That is God. <laughs> and that's the truth. And that's something we need to understand. We're going to talk more about that a little bit in, in, this, in this verse. I want to turn over to Romans chapter 11. You turn there with me. This is an important scripture, and this this goes along with what we're talking about today. It says in Romans chapter 11, Paul, in in the context of this verse, Paul is talking about the fact that the Jewish people were God's chosen people. God had, you know, spoken to Abraham. God chose his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and the promises were through the Jewish people. And God made great promises to the Jewish people. Isn't that wonderful? Except they rejected it over and over again. And so Jesus came to the Jew, and he ministered to the Jews. But ultimately, he said in Acts chapter 1, he said, go He said, you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where else? The uttermost parts of the the earth. And so if you look in Romans chapter 1, you'll see that Paul says, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power power of God unto those who believe. He said, for who first? For the Jew first, and then for who? The Gentile. How many Gentiles do we have in here? Okay, let's try this again. How many non-Jewish people do we have in here? Okay, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. It's just important to understand. Some people don't know that. It's not a cuss word. It just means you're not a Jewish. And so, as the gospel went forth, the Gentiles, for the most part, received, received the message of the gospel. You see, the, the, uh, the gospel went forth in all the Gentile world. And look throughout America. You know, America is full of Gentiles. And we all worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, don't we? But, The Jews, for the most part, have rejected their Savior. Now, there is a remnant, and Paul talks about that. But as he's thinking about this, and as he's talking about this, he's talking to the Gentiles, and he's saying, saying, listen, you know, don't don't think you're so special because um, you got grafted into the vine. Um, Let's see, verse 22. Verse 22, he's talking about how you shouldn't boast. This is before verse 22. You shouldn't boast 
that God has chosen you and uh, brought you into the, the olive tree. He said that you could be broken off again. And then he goes on in verse 22, and he says this, and this is what I want to focus on, Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 22. He says, therefore, consider the goodness and severity on, of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. This is not an encouraging passage necessarily, but it's one where Paul says, consider these things. Consider. You know what that means? It would be wise for you to take some time and think about these things. Not just think about the parts that you want to think about. Think about the whole picture. Think about all of who God is. And sometimes uh, we're not biblically, biblically literate enough to really understand what kind of God that we serve. And so Paul says, behold the goodness and severity of God. And where can these people look? Where can these people look to see the goodness and severity of God? Do they look out their window? Do they look what's going on in Rome? No, the place to look is the Scriptures. So Paul is telling them, take some time and consider how good and how severe God is by looking at the Scriptures that you have. And what Scriptures did they have? The Old Testament, right? Did you know in the book of Acts, when the, when the apostles were preaching the gospel and getting loads of people saved, that they only had the Old Testament? Now, I think sometimes we take the Old Testament like, that's a lot. I'm just going to skip over that and start in the New Testament. But that's all they had was the Old Testament. And, and sometimes we're taught that the Old Testament isn't applicable at all anymore, that we shouldn't even turn to the Old Testament. We shouldn't see what the Old Testament have to say because some people believe that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. Let me tell you something. That is false. The God that he was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is the same God he is at the very last verse of the book of Revelation. He has not changed one bit. And he gave us those, all these pages for us to learn and understand how he is. But sometimes we don't preach the whole counsel of God. But so, Paul says, consider the goodness and severity of God. You know, I, I saw a minister recently preaching a whole series on the goodness of God. Amen. That's good, isn't it? I think he's going like six weeks on the goodness of God. I wonder if he'll take another six weeks after that to talk about the severity of God. You know what, I, I, you know what my assumption is? He probably won't. You don't hear about it. People don't talk about it. Why? Because it's not, it's not fun to talk about. You know, when I was studying this subject, I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. This isn't where people, this isn't where you can just tell jokes and have a good time and cut up while you're in the pulpit. That's, that's what I'd like to do. But I see that the body of Christ is very unbalanced. And I see this, this concerns me. Because I don't, I don't think I talk about these things very often, but I talk about them enough to where sometimes I get accused of being the fire and brimstone preacher. But that's okay. Somebody's got to do it, right? So I'm not going to take any time right now, and I'm probably not going to take much time in this message to talk about the goodness of God. You've probably heard about the goodness of God, that God is very good, and you can see that throughout the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, God is much more good in the Old Testament than he is severe. And sometimes we think, we look in the Old Testament, and you're like, oh, man, all God did was, like, kill people in the Old Testament. You know, it's just like famines and plagues and you know, God striking people dead and people getting stoned. And, you know, we we're like, wow, look, I mean, all these bad things constantly happen in the Old Testament. But you got to remember, the Old Testament was risen, written over the space of 4,000 years. And a lot of these judgments that happened in the Old Testament were spaced long way apart. And the reason you hear so much about these judgments in the Old Testament is because God took a lot of time speaking to his prophets, warning the people. And so you have chapter after chapter after chapter, turn from your sins. I'm going to have to judge you, but I don't want to. Turn away from that so I don't have to pour out my fierce wrath upon you. Repent. Pages after page after page after page. And we think, well, God's just judging people. No, God is waiting a long time to judge people. The Bible says he is very long-suffering. The Bible says he does not inflict willingly. He's not wanting to. 
But the same God who inflicted upon people in the Old Testament those great terrors is the same God who one day will inflict greater terrors upon terrors upon people, and I think that day is not too far into the future. If you look in the Old Testament, that's nothing. The judgments of God are nothing compared to the judgments that are to come. The first thing I want to point out about God's judgments is that they are very severe. God's judgments are very severe, and they are severe because They have to be severe, and it's right for them to be severe. Everything God does is right. Everything God does is wise. And his judgments are severe because he is righteous and he is wise. I want to look at a couple examples of God's severity when it comes to his judgment. You know, you can think about so many different different, uh, examples in the Old Testament. You can think about the flood, when God flooded the world and drowned the whole world, except for eight who were saved. You know, you can think about the judgment of Korah, which is scary because, you know, when Korah rebelled against God, the Bible says the ground opened up and swallowed him alive, and they were screaming, everybody ran in terror. You can think about the snakes that came into the camp and bit people, and they died, and and Moses prayed, and and the people were like, take away the snakes. God said, I ain't taking away the snakes. He said, but I will put a snake on a pole, and if you look at that snake, you'll live. Who did that snake represent? Yeah, God's judgments are still on the earth today. He's not taking away his judgments, but he has given a cure that whoever wants to can escape from his judgments. How do they do that? They look at Christ. And then we can also look at some of the other judgments that are in the Bible. If you look at the book of Judges, for example, the book of Judges is just a whole a circle. The people rebel, God sends the enemies. They're like, oh my goodness, they repent. They rebel. God sends people to destroy, to hurt them. They repent. It's this whole thing. And then they they finally get to the point where they just continually rebel against God. And God begins to preach and he said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bring to pass what I talked about in the book of Deuteronomy when I announced the blessing of, blessings and cursings of obeying or disobeying God in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if you read through the Bible, man, I'll tell you what, if you're not reading through the Bible like this, you should be, because this, this stuff is, 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 is very important to read, number one. And it, it's, it's very interesting. And I, don't, I don't know how somebody picks up the Bible and they're like, this is boring. It's not boring. I'll read the Bible with my kids. And sometimes it's hard. I'm like, we're going to skip over that part right there. <laughs> sometimes I have to. Like, we just got to David and Bathsheba, and I'm reading with my three-year-old. And I'm like, and Bathsheba had a sleepover with David. You know, <laughs> and I said I'm explaining to my kids. I'm like, grown-ups aren't supposed to have sleepovers with anybody who's not their wife. So they're processing this, and <laughs> and there have been other times where I, I I I'll read stuff in the Bible and I read about God's judgment, and I'm I'm just like, this is hard. This is hard, but you know what? I'd rather it come from me than later on. They, they're like, Dad, you didn't tell us what well, that was in the Bible. And so, and so the, the Jewish people, what a bunch of boneheads. That's all I can say. And uh, I love the Jewish people. I'm very much pro-Israel, and I know God still has a heart for the Jewish people. I'm not saying that God has completely rejected them because he hasn't. He's brought them back into their land, because he's going to the Bible. Just a few verses later, it says, all of Israel will be saved. But the Jews were a bunch of boneheads, and they continued to rebel against God. They continued to serve their idols. And time after time again, God sent the prophets. God sent person after person, telling them to repent, but they wouldn't do it. And finally, God says, you know what? I'm stirring up the nation from the north, the nation of Babylon. At first, it was the nation of Assyria. You know, you know, your Bible history, Israel split into two nations. The nation of Israel, which was the northern kingdom. And the nation of Judah, which was the southern kingdom. The nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, was always bad. No exception. All the kings were bad. Bad, bad, bad. The guy who started the northern kingdom, I think it was Jeroboam, he installed two golden calves. What a bonehead! Because he didn't want people going to Jerusalem to worship. So he led all the 
people of Israel into idolatry. And as a result, God sent the Assyrians to destroy Samaria, which was the capital of Israel, and to destroy all the people of Israel and left Judah. Now, if you know anything about the Assyrians, I would encourage you to look it up. But they were a mean, cruel, wicked, cruel people. And the atrocities that they carried out upon the Israelites were great. And then Judah, Judah goes on for a little while, but the, the Bible says that God, Judah finally rejected, and, and uh, the Bible says that Judah followed the har- harlotry of her sister Israel, and she also was carried away to Babylon. And I want to talk about some of the judgments here, and you might have to brace yourself a little bit for some of these things. I want to talk to you about some of the judgments, the severe judgments that were carried out upon Judah. Now, the Bible doesn't record a lot of the judgments that were carried out upon Israel, but you can just look in history what the people of Assyria did to people. It was pretty bad. So let's see if I can find here. There we go. Okay, so here's, here's some passage that talks about God's judgment upon Judah. The Bible says the king of Babylon had no compassion on young man or woman on the aged or the weak. The Bible says the king of Babylon laid siege against the city, and the famine was very severe. In Lamentations 2, verse 20 to 23, it says, I want you, I want you to process this for a minute, okay? See, O Lord, and consider. This is Jeremiah, and he's, he's, in, he's, in, he's in ruins over what's happened. To whom have you done this? Should the women eat their, their offspring? The children they have cuddled? Should the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Young and old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in your anger. You have slaughtered and not pitied. Who did that? You have slain them in your anger. You have slaughtered and not pitied. Now, this was after much preaching and much extension of grace. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I want to turn there. Actually, I, got, I have it on my, uh, I'm going to skip around through it. But if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll see that God pronounces blessings and cursings upon the people. And uh, if you look in the whole of Deuteronomy chapter 28, you'll see that the blessings are only about this much and the cursings are about this much. Okay? Now, you don't have to read along with me because I'm going to jump around a little bit. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all the commandments and the statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of your wickedness of your doings, which you have done. That's verse 20. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and no one shall frighten them away. This is a tough one. You ready? Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people. Your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no strength in your hand. A nation you, shall not, you, sh- you, you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor. And you shall only be oppressed and crushed continually. So you shall be driven mad because of the sight which your eyes see. Verse uh, 47 to 48, 48. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. All right. Notice that this Lord is causing these things. Some people don't like to see, to see this, but this is important. In hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything, and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Who's he talking to here? He's talking to his own people.
They shall besiege you, and this is very, this is very interesting, and we're going we're gonna to make a, a real-life connection here. They shall, they shall besiege you at your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and, the, and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the sieged, in desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he has nothing left in the siege, in desperate straits in which the enemy shall distress you at your gates. All right, prepare yourself for this one, okay? The tender and delicate woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and to her daughter her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her children who she bears, for she will eat them in secret for the lack of everything in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you in all your gates. That's some very... Um, Sharp language, is it not? Why do you think the Lord spoke like this? I think this this type of language was used for a very good reason, and and I'm I'm not I have I have zero doubt that this stuff didn't happen. It did happen. Your life shall hang in doubt before you, and shall fear day and night, and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, "Oh, that it were evening," and in the evening you shall say, "Oh, that it were morning." because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes shall see. And look at this. And the Lord shall take you back to Egypt in ships by the way which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Now it's interesting. We know about the, uh, we know about the, the judgment that came upon Israel in Babylon. But there is also another great judgment that came upon Israel in more recent times. I say recent, it's not super recent. But when Jesus was on the earth, he talked about a judgment that was going to come upon Israel after he had died and risen from the dead. And that was the Romans who were going to come and uh, destroy Jerusalem. And that happened, and you can look at it in your history books. This isn't something you have to read the Bible to find out about. This happened in uh, 70 A.D. And um, I, took, I took some time. Let's see if I can find it here. Here it is, okay. I took some time to do some research on this. And there was a man named Josephus. He was a historian. And Josephus was a Jewish man, and he defected to the Romans. And he was the man who would go on the, the walls of Jerusalem, or I don't know how exactly it went, and he would tell the people of Jerusalem, he said, listen, surrender, and things will go well for you. It sounds like, almost, it's almost identical to what happened with Babylon. Because God said to the people in, Jer in Jerusalem during the time of the Babylonian siege, surrender, and things will go well for you. Just give up and give yourself to the Babylonians. And so Je Josephus was doing the same thing to the Jews. Give up, give yourself to the Romans, and things will go well, go well with you. But the Jews thought God was with them, and they resisted. And I want you to remember the things that I just read in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I want to read a little bit about what Josephus said when the Romans finally uh, broke down the walls and entered into the city, okay? They, the Roman soldiers, went in numbers. This is Josephus writing, and this happened in 70 A.D. The Roman soldiers went into numbers into the lanes of the city with their swords drawn. They slew those whom they overtook without and set fire to the houses whither the Jews were fled and burnt every soul in them and laid waste a great many of the rest. And when they were come to the houses to plunder them, they found the entire families of dead men in upper rooms full of dead corpses, that is, such as died by the famine. All right, didn't we just read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 28? God's judgment's coming upon these people.
They ran everyone through who they met and obstructed the very lanes with their dead bodies. They made the whole city run with blood to such a degree that indeed the fire of many of the houses was quenched with these men's blood. And now, since Titus' soldiers were already quite tired with killing men, and yet there appeared to be a vast multitude still remaining alive, Caesar gave orders that they should kill none but those who were in arms and opposed them, but they should take the rest alive. But together with those whom they had orders to slay, they slew the aged and the infirm. But for those who were in their flourishing age, who might be useful to them, they drove them together into the temple and shut them up within the walls. Of the young men, he chose the tallest and most beautiful and reserved them for the triumph, which was they marched them through the streets to humiliate them. And as for the rest of the multitude that were above 17 years old, he put them in bonds, listen to this, and sent them to the Egyptian mines. What is this? This is an exact fulfillment of what Deuteronomy chapter 28 says. Now, I want you to, I, 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 I want to say something real quick. And it says the rest of them were sent to the theaters by the sword. They were thrown to the wild beasts and they were sold for slaves. I want you to think about this judgment that came upon these people in 70 AD. This great judgment that's so obvious from God, and I, I, I believe Titus even understood that he was fulfilling God's will by bringing out judgment upon the Jewish people. Did this happen before Jesus died on the cross or after Jesus died on the cross? Did it happen before Jesus died on the cross or after Jesus died on the cross? After. You know, there's a, there's a false teaching that going out through the church right now that God doesn't judge people anymore since Jesus died on the cross. Have you heard that one before? It's not true. It's not true. God does still judge people. And you know, I can tell you the theological reasons why, but I don't want to get into that sermon today because that's another sermon. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look throughout the New Testament and see God's judgment. Remember what happened to Herod? He got eaten with worms and died. Remember what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? They were struck dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. What about the woman named Jezebel in the book of Revelation that Jesus talks to? He said, I'm going to give you time to repent. But if you don't, I'm going to throw you into into a sickbed. Gentle Jesus? Jesus said that. I'm only through my first point. Time to leave. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get through all this, but I'm going to, I'm going to go a little further here because I think it's important. So the first point, the first, the first point I wanted to make is God, God's judgments are severe, and that's important to understand. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. And these things I speak to you, not because I just want you to be struck in terror, but so that you can flee God's judgments. You know, oftentimes we present the gospel and we're like, you know what? Jesus has kind of made my life better, and I think he can make your life better too. And if you want to be a Christian and join the club, you know, you're welcome to. And if you don't, you know, that's okay. That's kind of how we present the gospel to it, to people. But no, this is the gospel. You have sinned against the holy God. And you need salvation. You will stand before God one day, and he will judge you for what you have done in your life because you have done things that are wrong, and you know it just like I have. And unless you make your, right life, your, your life right with God through the cross of Jesus Christ, you'll stand before a fearsome God, and you'll suffer his judgments, and we know what his judgments are like because he has told, told us what they're like. And Jesus said, don't fear those. And, you know, we, we see all these, these harsh judgments that come upon people's lives in this earth. But Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body, and that's it. He said, let me tell you who you should fear. Fear him whom after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. And so when we preach the gospel, we should make sure that we mention, listen, this isn't a, this isn't a, a decision. This isn't joining a little club. This is you escaping from death. And the only escape is Jesus Christ. Just like Noah, when he was on the ark preaching, he's like, listen, a flood's coming, and you're all going to perish. There's one way you can be saved. Get in the boat. Get in the boat, and you'll be saved. When the snakes were biting the people, 
God didn't take away the snakes, but he said there's one way you can be saved. Look at the snake. Right now, people in your sins, there's one way you can escape from hell. Look to the cross. Look to the cross and be saved. Because otherwise you'll suffer the the righteous, the holy, the right judgment of God which is coming upon the whole earth. The second point I want to point out, and this is scary, is that those people who are under the judgment of God were not aware of their guilt. And this, this, this flabbergasts me. When you read through the Old Testament, and when you read through the New Testament, when you see the people that the prophets are preaching to and who they're ministering to, oftentimes the judgment of God is looming right over top of them, and they're not aware of it. They're going through life like there's nothing wrong. The Bible says in the days of Noah, they're just eating and drinking and getting married and having a good time. But the day was, the clock was ta- counting down minute by minute, and they're unaware that their destruction was coming. And then one day, suddenly, suddenly destruction came and there was no hope for them. The door was closed. God shut the door and they couldn't get on the ark. And so, and so is the truth here in America. People are going around living their life like everything's hunky dory, like everything's fine. They haven't bothered to look and see what God has said. They don't realize that judgment is looming. And they're they're uncareful about the life, their life, but the clock is ticking. The Bible says all the people are going to say peace and safety. And when they say and when they say peace and safety, listen, when somebody gets into government office and says peace and safety, you better run for the hills because sudden destruction is going to come upon us all. And if you're in Christ, though. The Bible says that he'd spare us from that time of judgment which will come upon the face of the earth. In the book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was preaching about the judgments that were to come upon the earth, all the people looked at Jeremiah. And once again, you want to say, what's wrong with you, boneheads? They said to Jeremiah, why has the Lord pronounced this great disaster against us? What is our iniquity? And what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord? They're unaware. Lot's son-in-laws. When fire and brimstone was about to rain down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot looks at his son-in-laws and he says, get out of the city. The Lord shall destroy the city. What did they do? They chuckled. They said, oh, old Lot. (laughs) Old Lot. He's just a religious, you know, whatever. He just, he need to settle down. Lot, you're fine. And the angels are like, get out of the city. Get your wife. Get your children. Get out of the city. And Lot's son-in-laws, completely oblivious. Think about that for a second. Completely oblivious to the judgment that was coming. Thought it was a joke. Perished when the fire of God fell upon the city. Jesus said to the Jews in his time, he said, He said, the days are coming when the city walls are going to be penetrated. He said, all this is coming upon you because you did not know the time of your visitation. In the book of 2 Chronicles, Josiah found the Bible in the temple. It was buried somewhere in a closet. And Josiah was a righteous king, but he was a righteous king without the Bible. How did that work? So they find the Bible, and he reads the Bible, and he tears his clothes, and he says, woe to us, because we have not done what this book told us to do. And he had no idea until he got the book and read it. And what did he do afterwards? He sent to the prophet, and he said, hey, we read these words in this book. What do you have to say? And what did the prophet say? These judgments are coming upon you. The king didn't know it. The people didn't know it. Nobody knew it. Because it didn't take time to understand it. Listen, God's given us plenty to understand what's coming. And we're like people sometimes that are just like, well, we've heard this before. But the Bible says mockers will come the last day. And the reason it hasn't come yet is because God's long-suffering, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't live another moment with your life in jeopardy. Don't think that, well, everything seems okay right now. That's what the people in the flood of Noah's days thought. That's what Lot's son-in-laws thought. Everything's okay. Everything's great. Everything is awesome. 
and we miss what's really happening, what's really going on. Let me tell you, there's a window into the world of the supernatural. There's a window into the world of the spiritual, what God is doing. That window is this, and the only way you're going to see it is by looking through this window. And when you see it, it's scary. Because Jesus said, a judgment is coming upon this earth that unlike anything has ever been. I want you to take Babylon coming upon the Jews. I want you to take the Assyrians coming upon the Jews, the flood, every terrible plague of the Old Testament, the Holocaust, all the genocides that happened. Those are peanuts compared to what's coming in the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. Do you want to be here for that? When when billions of people are being killed upon right here on this earth, that's what the Bible says is coming. The Great Tribulation is going to be worse than anything that's ever happened on the face of the earth. Sometimes we read some of that poetic language, we don't understand it. But that's what Jesus is saying. Is it's, it's, it's the billions, billions, billions of people will be slaughtered. And the ones that aren't killed are going to wish they were dead. That's what's coming. That's reality. That's what the Bible says. Don't listen to me. Listen to what the Word of God says. So what you need to ask yourself today, right now, is, is, is my life right with God? If I were to die this instant or if Jesus were to come back this instant, how would I fare? And some of you guys are uncareful about your Christian walk. It's, it's time to start getting serious because Jesus said, hold fast to the things lest you let them slip. Hold fast to the things you have learned, lest you let them slip. It's so easy for things to slip away unless you hold fast. Where are you in your Christian walk? Are you serious about your Christian life? Are you seeking God the way you should? Are you dabbling with sin? Are you looking to the world for advice rather than looking to the book for advice? Don't be one that's caught unprepared. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word, Lord God. It's important for us to talk about these things. It's not fun necessarily, Lord God. It's not a topic that I would choose. There's really a lot more that I had to say today, Lord, but I think enough was said to get the main point across. You are a great and terrible God. That is, you invoke terror, Lord. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But I'm only saying these things because I am convinced by the Word of God that they are true. That you judge, Lord, even today. And that ought to put fear into our hearts so that we can flee from the wrath to come and put our trust in the Savior who will forgive us of our sins and give us the gift of everlasting life. Now, with everyone, your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you this. If you're in this place and you say, this this message the Lord spoke to me, Brother Hal, and my life is not right with God. Now you may, you may call yourself a Christian, maybe, maybe you don't. But you're like, I have not given my life to Christ and I need to. Or I'm far away from God and I need to make sure my life is right with God. If that's you in this place, you say, I need, to make, I need to come to Christ or I need to make my life right with God. I just want you to lift your hand so I can see it. Is there anyone here? I see that hand. Thank you. Is there any, other, any others? You're in this place. Thank you. I see your hand. Any others who say, I need to get my life right with God. I'm away from the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. What I want to do, and this is something that you have to do in your heart to the Lord. It's, it's not a matter of praying a prayer. It's just a matter of you repenting, turning from your sin, forsaking sin, and putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Let's all pray this after me. And if you believe this and adhere to this, your sin will be forgiven, your soul will be saved, and Jesus will be your Lord. Repeat after me. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. Your judgments are severe, but your grace and your mercy are greater than your judgments. I come to you, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Save me from my sin. I put my faith and trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. I give my life to you now. In Jesus' name.